Welcome to episode 22, The Woman and the Jug. Hey, creatives. I'm C. Jordan Blakera, and welcome to the Whispering Worth to the World podcast. I'm a master certified life and artist coach who specializes in working with creatives. This is where I share what I would tell my younger self if I could, what I've learned about the art of being human, about our inherent divine equality, and how it all relates to navigating our creative expression in the world. Today's episode is a little different. I'm going to narrate a story I wrote an allegorical tale that I hope will help you to bring more and more of your authentic self into the world. Let me start by setting the stage. Think of an old-timey Western town centered on a plot of land with maybe a mountain range off in the distance in one direction and flat land spreading out as far as the eye can see in another direction. And in this town of old, there is one dusty dirt thoroughfare that runs through the town. It is the one street of this one street town. A row of storefronts lines each side of the main street. Wooden hitching posts stand outside of the various buildings where riders tether their horses before venturing into the establishment they have traveled quite a distance to visit. Meanwhile, wagons, some covered, some not, travel up and down the street, pulled by a horse or maybe two. Some are passing through. Some may stop to water their horses or themselves. Some may rest for a spell, and some may have come to restock their provisions. In which case, they may visit one of the storefronts facing the street. And one of these storefronts is a mercantile selling general merchandise. It's the kind of store where the sugar you want to buy might be weighed by hand on a scale with a one pound bar on one side of the scale and your precious sugar on the other with the store owner adding a little bit more sugar and a little bit more until the scales are even. And this store being a general merchandise store has some basic hardware tools, hammers and nails, a few bolts of fabric, a few dishes and utensils for sale, even a few toys for the kids. The shelves and displays are full of products and merchandise, so the store owner can appeal to a broad range of clientele. She has hung pretty curtains in the window to catch the eye of passersby who might look in and remember, ooh, perfect, I'm running low on sugar, or maybe dried beans or tobacco. Come in for some sugar, leave with a toy for the kids, come in for a few yards of plain cotton fabric, leave with a new measuring cup for the kitchen. And if you were to look very closely in this shop, maybe if you were to open a low cupboard and look all the way in the back, behind the backup inventory of measuring cups and toys, behind the seasonal items that only are brought out at certain times of the year, you might see a little glass vial with a bit of liquid in it. You would not see these vials easily. If you were coming in for sugar, they would be easy to miss, tucked as they were here and there at the back of a shelf or in the shadow of a corner or behind a large item. While the shop owner had an abundant supply of the liquid, it had a strong odor and would make the muscles in your jaw seize when taken in even the smallest dose. The liquid was hardly palatable, but its healing powers were undeniable. Strong medicine, one might say. It was almost impossible to get past the smell and the taste. Even plugging your nose and tightly squeezing your eyelids together hardly helped. The store owner clearly did not want to give an eye-level shelf space to these liquid vials, or heaven forbid a countertop position, especially not near the cash register, which was prime space for impulse purchases. Items designed to be an easy yes, like a bowl full of wrapped bubblegum or pieces of candy selling for two to three cents each. No, these vials instead were stuffed into crevices among the merchandise only to be found like a wayward cashew or paper clip, long forgotten and discovered quite by accident one day between the seat cushions of your couch. If you happen to find the vials, you might ask the shop owner what they were. 
And she might casually reply, oh, just a container to hold a tiny amount of something, something you hold dear and don't need very much of, but might need someday. Most times she didn't even mention the substance inside. But the funny thing about these vials was that in the store owner's heart of hearts, the liquid stored inside the vials was the substance, actually the medicine that she most wanted to sell. And one day she could no longer abide hiding the liquid in vials and stuffing them into the most remote areas of her store. So an idea was hatched. She will become a baker. And the master plan is to squeeze a drop or two of this liquid, this strong medicine, into each confectionery creation, into each sugary delight. A cake with a drop or two, surrounded by delectable frosting, flour and butter, made it all better to mask the bitter taste. It made it all the more palatable so as to heal all the more people. Preparing for her next adventure, the store owner collects all the vials and pours the liquid into a single jug that she caps with a cork. Next, she empties the store of all the general merchandise and remakes the store into a bakery with displays for all of the pies, cakes, cookies, and confections. The wooden shingle that hangs outside the door changes from general merchandise to one that now reads fine pastries. Recipes are tested and tweaked. The shopkeeper seeks the secrets to a light, fluffy crust. She perfects her buttercream frosting, making it almost irresistible. Much time is spent experimenting with the recipes until the results are flawless. She discovers just the right proportion of ingredients and knows that her baking times and temperatures are dependable. Fine pies and exquisite cakes are baked. Everyone wonders what the daily specials will be because they know they will be delicious. And for every mix of batter, the jug is uncapped, the eyedropper is filled, and one or two drops of this liquid is placed into each bowl of ingredients. If you know what to look for, you can taste a hint of this secret ingredient, but if not... You might not even notice with all the other exciting explosions your taste buds are experiencing. The newly ordained baker will be sure the ingredient is in every creation, but she dare not state it plainly. She dare not yell from the rooftops, every creation in my establishment carries the imprint of the jug's elixir. She does not make this clear. I have become a baker so that every item that is sold in my establishment will carry my signature elixir. As time goes on, the store becomes known for its fine pastries. The pies take home first place prizes. The cakes are sought for many special occasions. The delectable treats become rewards for jobs well done. Celebrations become reasons to order fine pastries from this fine establishment. Strolling by, you might be lured in by the delicious smell of baking in the air. If not, by the many treats placed just inside the front window atop an eye-catching red and white plaid tablecloth. Even Aunt May had to admit the pie crust here was better than her own family recipe. So many accolades and applause have been bestowed on the shop owner. And at least, she told herself, the elixir was consumed by more customers than the intrepid few who had found the vials that were so well hidden within the mercantile. But the funny thing about these fine pastries and baked goods was that in the store owner's heart of hearts, the liquid that was sparingly dropped into each and every item was the product, the substance actually the medicine that she most wanted to sell. And one day she could no longer abide concealing the liquid in a wide selection of bakery items. So an idea was hatched. All the baking equipment would be sold. The shelves would be made completely bare. The countertops completely cleared. The store would be cleared of every vestige of the fine pastry establishment. There would be no reminders of the store's prior incarnation. And now, 
there would be no mistaking what is being sold because there is only one item being sold. In the center of the stripped bare store with its weathered wooden floorboards sits a small table, also made of wood. And every morning, the store owner places her jug on the unadorned table just prior to unlocking the front door to the establishment. Two chairs face each other, one on each side of the small table, one for the customer, one for the store owner. And should any customer enter and place their cup on the table next to the jug, the proprietor will remove the cork, lift the jug with both hands, pour the elixir, and fill the cup provided. And when she pours, regardless of what anyone else sees, what the store owner sees is liquid gold pouring into the customer's cup. From the boardwalk that lines the front of each building, you can peer inside the sole four-paned front window. And passers-by see the empty shelves. They see the table with the jug. Many are disinterested or confused, to say the least. Some are a bit curious, but most walk right on by. And the shingle now reads, Elixir for Sale. Dust accrues day after day in this dusty, one-street town, and the proprietor sweeps regularly so that the shop will be nice for those who enter. Spiders build their webs inside, but they don't stand a chance against the proprietor's broom. And every once in a while, someone enters. The elderly man, bent and curled forward, sits in the chair and produces a porcelain cup. The proprietor pours her liquid gold, her signature elixir, the man drinks and seems to sit a tiny bit taller as his spine unfurls. At another time, a big, burly, strong man enters, maybe a circus performer passing through. He pretends to not notice the proprietor, an interesting choice since they are the only two inside the barren store. He wanders past the table and silently leaves his metal cup. Now they both know why he is here even though he feigns disinterest. Once his cup is filled, he surreptitiously replaces the cup with some coins and is gone without a word. Most days, the shopkeeper sweeps and knocks down cobwebs. While the days are quieter than before when the bakery bustled with excited children who came for their favorite cookie or patrons who sought the prize-winning pies, the shopkeeper is glad for having declared I am not a baker. I am a woman with a jug. Bring your cup and I will fill it. This is my offer. I place the jug on the table. I unlock the front door of the store. I attend to the sweeping and the cobwebs. And the shingle reads, Elixir for Sale. And before hanging the third shingle, she declared this. I have accepted that there may be fewer customers at first. I will be patient. This elixir is my proprietary signature blend. It is my offer that I will no longer dilute or disguise. I have but one thing to offer, the elixir that pours from the jug. Because I am not a baker. I am a woman with a jug. And with that declaration, a curious thing happened. Memories of the dusty one-street town she had traveled through during her lifetime started to wander into her inner purview. Images of the various storefronts and shingles she had seen floated by the blacksmith with the apron, the tutor with the books, the musician with the knowledge of music history and instruments, the carpenter whose woodwork was so lauded that his reputation had spread to neighboring counties. The shopkeeper recalled one after the other the many proprietors of their own custom blends, some with a jug, some with jewels and gems, some with a general knowledge of this, that, or the other thing. 
She considered these other people who had hung their shingle, swept their floors, and attended to the cobwebs. The others who had remained steadfast and ultimately fed their families and paid for their shelter with what they offered. She was not alone. There were other purveyors of their version of liquid gold. There were others who had declared in their own way, I am not a baker. I am a woman with a jug, and this is my offer. Hey, creatives. I will have future classes and trainings on the self-worth of the soul, as well as stepping outside of the entire paradigm most of us don't even know we're trapped in, so that we can live and create with more innovation, invention, and infinite choice. Want to know more? Go to www.createanyway.today forward slash soul. S-O-U-L. That's createanyway.today forward slash soul.